good morning everyone it's my pleasure to welcome jason jason kong is the volcano chair for engineering excellence professor and former department chair at the ucla computer science department the joint appointment from the electrical and computer engineering department the director of center for domain specific computing and the director of vlsi architecture synthesis and technology vast laboratory Dr. Kong's research interests include novel architectures and compilation for customizable computing, synthesis of VLSI circuits and systems, and highly scalable algorithms. He has over 500 publications in these areas, including 16 best paper awards and three papers inducted to the FPGA and Reconfigurable Computing Hall of Fame. He co-founded AutoESL, which developed the most widely used high-level synthesis tool for FPGAs renamed to Vivado HLS after Xilinx acquisition, and more recently, Falcon Computing Solutions to enable FPGA acceleration in data centers, also acquired by Xilinx. He was elected to an IEEE Fellow in 2000, ACM Fellow in 2008, the National Academy of Engineering in 2017, and the National Academy of Inventors in 2020. He is the recipient of the 2022 IEEE Robert Noyce Medal. Welcome, Jason. It's my honor to invite you. Coming from Intel, I mean, getting Robert Noyce Medal, the, the latest recipient of Robert Noyce Medal adds um, a special welcome for you, Jason. Welcome. Uh, Chitra, thank you so much for the introduction. So um, uh, it's my pleasure uh, to uh, speak to this audience. And I always wanted to attend this per uh, events in person, um, but uh, this is the second best thing that I can actually share some of my research results with you uh, virtually. The topic today is uh, democratizing IC designs and the customized computing. And I'll explain what I mean in a moment. Um, so the conference has a great theme talking about silicon uh, catalyzing computing communication and the cognitive convergence, right? Um, however, if you look at the trend, uh, the performance and the uh, growth that, uh, of general purpose processors, which used to be the main engine that drive the, uh, the computation, communication, the cognitive convergence, it uh, had a spectacular growth in the 1980s all the way to 19, uh, 2000, but has slowed down considerably recently down to 12% uh, a year and then uh, down to 3% a year. And that's for the general purpose uh, computer. However, we believe there's a, a lot of a room where you can adapt the computer architecture to do domain specific customization. Um, so we actually submitted a proposal to the National Science Foundation in the US back in 2008, 2009. Unfortunately, we got funded with so established center for uh, domain specific computing. And so the goal there was to look beyond parallelization to focus on domain specific customization for significant power performance uh, efficiency. The previous talk talked about a, a machine learning accelerator. That's a good example. I will also come back to that. And so we had a position paper 2011. And uh, more recently, we actually had a, um, a, a good overview paper about the one hour research in the past decade uh, in IEEE proceedings this invited paper goes from single chip to data centers. So let me give you some uh, successful examples of customization. Uh, the, the best known one probably is the uh, Google TPUs, right? Everyone has heard about it. Uh, the first version was 2017. Uh, I'm just quoting the published result in 2017 that uh, and so it was actually an upgrade that, uh, from uh, DDR3 to DDR5, and the bandwidth goes up to 180 gigabytes per second. So at that time, and if you look at the data in the paper, that's 200x faster than a general purpose CPUs, and even 70x that uh, a more performance, basically more energy efficient, right? Uh, performance per watt compared to the, uh, at that time, the, the leading edge uh, GPUs. Of course, in the last five, six years, the, the both GPUs and CPUs has improved a lot and the G TPUs also went through multiple revision. But uh, uh, that was just uh, a snapshot at, at, at that particular time. Nevertheless, you show the power of a customization. 
The problem in the hardware is that not everyone can do such a design because you know doing an ASIC design takes hundreds of millions of dollars and uh, from a, a design process verification and all the way to creating mask. And also it takes too long to build. Typically a project like this takes somewhere uh, at least 12 months, possibly all the way to 24 months. Uh, often the time that the, the algorithm has changed, the application has changed. Um, so uh, what I'm going to say is that uh, we want to enable everyone to be able to do customization. So what comes to our mind is to use FPGAs. Uh, many of you probably are familiar with that. It stands for Field Programmable Gate Arrays. And uh, really because they have a, a lot of uh, configurable logic blocks or lookup tables, and you can customize it to implement any logic functions you want. Uh, in addition, that they also have a number of dedicated components, for example, memories, multipliers, I/O processors, right? So that give you the additional efficiency. Um, if you have generated the bitstream, you can reprogram the FPJ in seconds that, uh, to get a new functionality. And also, it's very affordable. Uh, for example, you can go to the uh, Amazon AWS cloud, spend a dollar or two an hour, right, to uh, get your FPGA and customize it to do uh, high performance computation. All my classes are taught on Amazon Cloud now using FPGAs just to do customization. So that's our main implementation platform. Uh, the shortcoming, of course, that the FPGA has a lower density and lower clock rate uh, compared to uh, ASIC designs. So you may lose 5x or 10x in overall performance. But then, nevertheless, I will show you that still. Uh, there's a significant advantage compared to general purpose uh, computing. Um, so let me show you some examples. Uh, this is, a, a, I'm taking, for example, sorting a big data and uh, terabytes of a data or gigabytes of a data as one example. Um, we designed a multiple FPGA-based sorting engines. So let me tell you the one we have for a, a D1 level sorting. Um, so the first stage is that you all know about the merge sort. And that we can actually in, in implement merge sort in hardware where you can read data from, from a high, uh, high bandwidth memory, HBMs. Uh, typically, HBM has uh, 32 channels, and you can, in our case, we take 16 channels as input and another 16 as output. Then you recursively merge the data you have. But that's the phase one. And then you get a bigger and a bigger chunk of the data which has been sorted. And then in phase two, we're actually going to reuse the merge trees we have in phase one and then merge this data together. So the result is that if we give you a, a kind of data point for comparison, we can sort four gigabytes of the data in that uh, 0.25 seconds. This is a 85X speed up over the, the 32 thread uh, CPU implementations. So even with FPGAs, with customization, um, the, this circuit does nothing uh, else except Right, the sorting uh, at a very high throughput. So you can still get tremendous improvement. The industry has used the FPGA at a very large scale as well. So this is actually a case from uh, uh, Microsoft. In fact, in their case is that uh, they have an FPGA um, uh, configured as a bump in the wire before they connect to the data center switch and they go through an FPGA. And uh, so they can do a lot of on-the-fly computation. So this example they published was on acceleration for deep learning. Um, and the paper was published uh, uh, again that uh, almost five years ago. You can see that uh, with uh, different devices, this is a different FPGAs from Intel, at uh, um, Area 10 and the Stratix 10, and uh, also different versions. And then also with different bit widths, you can go all the way to uh, 90 uh, teraops per second. If you remember my early slides, this is actually quite comparable to TPUs. But this one is totally reconfigurable. And, uh, if you don't like uh, uh, the idea of using uh, FPGA for deep learning acceleration anymore, you can reconfigure this to support search engines, data compression, or whatever applications you want. So that's the flexibility you have. So you may ask, hey, why that uh, general purpose processor is uh, so much behind this customized engine? Let me just show you one example. 
because general purpose processor, the keyword is general purpose, right? It's very powerful that I can implement any instructions you want. So they have this instruction execution pipeline. So think about if you just want to do add operation, right? You have to fetch the instruction, right? And uh, you do a decode to see which instruction is that. And then uh, sometimes to avoid uh, the name conflict, I have to rename one of the operands or both operands. And then maybe the data is now uh, available. So you actually have to wait, right? That uh, to be scheduled in a reservation station. And finally, when the, or both data are available, you execute in the ALUs. And then, and then finally you can write it back. But uh, if you are doing out of order execution, you have to have a reorder buffer so that uh, everyone before you has been committed and you can write it back. So you can see for a single add operation, just two numbers, you get a sum, you go through this lengthy process pipeline. So we quantified it in our paper in Design Automation Conference back in 2014, saying that really in this long pipeline, there's only 10% to 30% of a computation is useful. The rest is at the tax you pay to support general purpose computation. Um, in fact, uh, this paper from uh, Stanford um, also make a, a further point, so saying that the specialization or customization can allow you to have special data type and operations. So in one cycle, you can do uh, tens of that uh, to a thousand uh, uh, instructions, equivalent instructions, so give you this much of a gain. It's mass, a massive parallelism and uh, a thousand X or more, not 16 X or 32 X, it is the number of cores you have. And uh, then it also has customized memory, right? High bandwidth, and low energy uh, usage. And also reduce the or uh, amortize the overhead. For example, as I said, you don't have this long instruction decoding pipeline. Like that. Uh, and then you also can do uh, algorithm architecture code design, which we have done uh, quite a bit in the past as well for various kind of application. So altogether, that's where you get this uh, uh, 10,000 X energy efficiency. Um, you can get this on ASIC. You can still get it on FPGAs even with 5x, 10x of a uh, loss of a efficiency right, relative to ASIC, but still tremendous gain over customized, um, uh, over general purpose processors. So you may say, okay, great. Then uh, what's the problem? That the, why not everyone designing uh, your yeah, own customized uh, accelerators? The problem is that uh, most of the people that are in the IT industry are software developers. For example, I'm taking the data from the uh, United States, there are about 1.8 million software developers. And this is from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. There are only about 66,000 people that uh, they consider a computer hardware engineer, whether they can all do IC design, so IPJ design, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, all the hardware designers as in the 60s. So the difference is that uh, almost 20X, 30X, or even larger, right? So basically, that the uh, FPGA and ASIC are not easy to design. Not everyone can do that. So that's actually the theme of my research, is I want to enable every software developers, or most of the software developers, to be able to design customized computing engines. You may say, is it really that hard? I heard this thing called the high-level synthesis, where you can take the C programs and then generate accelerators. Um, indeed, there's tremendous progress in, on this subject in the past. In fact, my lab is at the very forefront of that. Uh, some of you may read our paper back in 2006, we have a high-level synthesis system called X-Pilot. It was quite successful. We can synthesize something like an MPEG decoder um, automatically. And then we get a lot of industry uh, interest from the industry. We spin up the company called the Autopilot. And uh, uh, with a product called Autopilot, the name of the company called Auto ESL. That's what got acquired by Zidings, um, uh, which I mentioned in the introduction. So that's the basis of their Vivado HRS high level synthesis tool. Um, it allows you to do a C based synthesis. We support uh, IEEE uh, standard floating point operations. And there's a lot of uh, special optimizations we have. Uh, the quality of the result matches or exceeds the RTL designs in many cases. 
And uh, so if you are interested in all the detail, we have an invited paper, a keynote paper in an XB transaction on CAD um, not more than 10 years ago. Um, there's a high level census for FPGA you know, to, from prototype to deployment. If you do a Google search, there are thousands of papers using Vivado HR. So I'm, I'm sure some of you in the audience probably have used it quite a bit. You said, that's great. Is another case a software designer can just use this tool to create uh, accelerators? Uh, but uh, not as uh, quite as simple. Let's take a very simple example, like a CNN convolutional neural network. Uh, you are very familiar with that. With some initialization, the main computation is the six level uh, next to the loop. Basically for every output uh, image you're going to do convolution on every input image, and you do it for the row and the column, and you do this uh, P times Q convolution, right? the K by K convolution. Um, the good news is that you just feed this C code into that uh, uh, high level synthesis tool. You do get a circuit, but the circuit actually is 80X slower than even a single core CPU. So you don't get acceleration, that you get actually deacceleration. So what happened? The problem are multiple. For example, um, you take these uh, parameters, you map it to the, uh, this uh, DRAMs, and then you are reading it at a 32 bit at a time. And also uh, in CPUs, you have cache, you cache the data, but this time that the, by default, um, when you design your own accelerator, unless you specify that there's no cache, there's no data reuse, you have to get it from DRAM every time. Also, if you don't do anything, there's no parallelization, that uh, all these loops are executed sequentially. Uh, plus, there's actually memory bank conflicts that uh, although there's plenty of on-chip memories, you cannot utilize that very efficiently. Uh, also, remember FPGA, the clock frequency typically is 5x slower. Um, so this runs at 300 uh, megahertz versus CPU can run other um, two gigahertz, right? Uh, so as a result, you actually are slower than a single core CPU. Of course, like my students, they get this result, they will not be satisfied, they, say they will optimize. Um, so they will introduce on-chip buffers, right, to cache the data. They will do fine-grained pipelining. They will do fine-grained uh, parallelization. They also do coarse-grained pipeline so that uh, you can overlap computation with communication and then you will do a lot of a uh, memory partition that, uh, so that you can have a huge amount of a concurrency like what I was shown in the early slides. So with this optimization, now, now we are get 7,000 X speed up over a single CPU core. Even you have 32 cores running or uh, concurrently, we are still at uh, let's say 20 X uh, the um, uh, 30 X faster, right? Uh, but it's a lot of effort. You can see that that six line of a code become 150 lines of a code with 28 parameters tells you where to do memory partition and how you do pipelining and so on and so forth. This is where that the most of the um, that the uh, software developers stop. They kind of get the worried whether I can handle that. So, um, so this is actually the. Uh, the problem we want to overcome. We want the software programmer to start with the language they're familiar with. For example, Cafe, TensorFlow, Spark, Highlight, or whatever domain specific language, or at least they can start from C, C++ without much of a modification. And uh, so we actually have support of this kind. And then internally we're going to uh, compile it into some intermediate representation. So we have this HyperCL, which uh, a joint work with Cornell that they won the best paper award at PTA uh, three years ago. And the MLIR is a, a community-wide effort originally started by Google and Intel. So, and the, from here, then they're working to create uh, automatically customized architectures, for example, systolic arrays and uh, stencil computation. There's also a new type of architecture we call that composable parallel and pipeline architecture, or CPP. So if you have a certain patterns, we will generate this automatically for you. If you don't, uh, we're going to use machine learning techniques to actually search for best optimization. So as a programmer, uh, as a designer, you don't know anything. You just write efficient CPU friendly code and, um, and then we can give you the customized power. 
So that's what I call democratize, that uh, uh, customize uh, computing or democratize accelerated design. And so uh, most of the IT professionals can enjoy that. So I'll give you two examples. One is this, uh, architecture guided designs. Uh, um, many of you have heard this concept called the systolic way. So we want to be able to design that automatically. So uh, the concept of systolic way is uh, very elegant. So you have a set of uh, processing elements or PEs. They are connected in 1D or 2D grid. And uh, they give you a massive parallelism. Obviously, all of them will be doing some executions simultaneously. Moreover, they give you a locality. Uh, each uh, processing element only communicated to its neighbors, either in the horizontal direction or in the vertical direction. So the locality gives you the energy efficiency. Um, so that's why it's so popular. For example, Google TPU, uses Solid Ray, Tesla, self-driving uh, cars, they have uh, some accelerator you based on uh, the accel uh, systolic way. Also the uh, Amazon, like, uh, they are influencing Android. Uh, however, that uh, it's not easy to design a system. I can um, warn you <laughs> that. Uh, let me tell you the story. We started this effort back in 2014 uh, without knowing actually Google's effort. We independently designed a systolic way for matrix multiplication. I have a very bright undergraduate student and they worked with me for actually five months in the summer and the summer plus the fourth quarter. And uh, we wrote the 1700 lines of RTL code and finally, we did get running at the close 200 gigaflops per second on the Zilin side PGA. This is considered state of art. Uh, you may say, well, student may not be that efficient, but you look at this data coming from Intel. Um, it's very uh, similar story that, uh, in fact, that this design per HMN, BGG 16, and then matrix multiplication, they are all systolic designs. They go from four months all the way to 18 months, right? So it shows you the time to do coding, verification, performance tuning. So um, that's actually the kind of a hurdle, the barrier that we're facing. We want to automate this process. And the way we do that is that now we have a completely automated tool. You can actually give me the C code that uh, actually we're going to rely on polyhedral compilation module to do a legality check. First, we want to understand what whether your loop or nested loop is uh, feasible to be implemented by a systolic way. The way we check that is to make sure there's a uniform, constant uh, dependency of distance one, right? And then if it can be done, then we'll do computation management, communication management. Uh, we can actually have an output tuner to look for the best uh, configurations. And then finally, we can give you uh, systolic way either in Zilin IPGA or in Intel IPGA or in ASIC through this mentor catalog and C. So let me give you one example why it's so difficult and what are the solution space we are facing. So first you have this concept called the space-time mapping. So this is just a three-level nested loop for matrix multiplication we are all familiar with saying that I for, for all I or J and uh, basically for each IJ elements, I'm going to do this. Uh, a i k times b k j, right? The summation of that over four k. So for this three level, three uh, level nested loop, you have to decide which levels goes to the space dimension, which level goes to the time dimension. So that's called the uh, space time mapping. So in this case, I'm taking i j into the basically space dimension. The k will be executed sequentially on each p. That's the time dimension. Um, but you can have a huge matrix multiplication. It's too big to map to a single systolic array. So in this case, you've got to tile. Maybe you can say my systolic array is small. I can only design a four by four systolic array. So that's why I have to tile my loop. So the innermost uh, three levels of nested loop is four by four by four. So that's called the array partition. You go from a, a arbitrary design to a kind of a physical implementation. And it's often the case that, uh, that the, uh, the computation may take more than one cycle and for the innermost loop. It's not that ideal. I do one cycle of the communication, I hand it, a computation, hand it to my labors. So what happens if you do six, eight, or 12 computation? So in this case, uh, while I'm doing 
finish one, I'm going to pick up another independent um, task. I'm going to execute it. That's called the uh, latency hiding. So basically, I'm going to take some further loops that I'm actually doing that in a pipeline fashion uh, at the innermost loop. And then finally, I will actually do the CMD vectorization. The PE doesn't have to be executing just one element. I can execute multiple elements, right, the vectorization. So, um, so these will be all done automatically. Of course, it says, how do you decide the parameter? What's the tiling parameter? What's the vectorization parameter? And so on and so forth. So for this, we have a, a intelligent search engine where we do mathematical programming-based optimization to start with, and we do evolution-based search. And as a result, that uh, we have a highly optimized solution. You can see, for example, for matrix multiplication for CNN, the only num number of input lines is somewhere from seven to 10, right? The SQL, you consider the loop nest. And the output high-level synthesis code are in close to 10,000 for each one of them. So this shows you the productivity gain. Not only that, that uh, uh, it's uh, highly productive, that um, we also can generate highly competitive design. Uh, for example, I'm showing the, the, uh, the comparison in the auto essay in our solution compared to the reference design state of art in other applications, we are consistently better in the, both the performance and also very comparable in the DSP uh, efficiency. Right? Um, so this tool is completely uh, open source. And if you are interested in it, you can go to my, uh, web, uh, my lab's website and download it and uh, play with it. And uh, we'll be very interested to hear of your feedback. If you like it, uh, you should give a start. Um, now you can say, well, that's wonderful. For Cesare, we understand you can cover that very well. What about the general C, C++ program? Maybe you want to do some data compression and the encryption that can you generate the uh, computing engine very efficiently. So for this, we also made tremendous progress. The way we have that is that the, first we'll build on this Merlin compiler. Um, developed by Falcon Computing. That was acquired by Zilinx, but it's an open source project. So many of you know OpenMP for do parallel computation. So this is just a very OpenMP style. Remember in OpenMP, you write a program like a Pragma OMP parallel. You talk about how many thread you use. Here's the same thing. You can visit Pragma Excel. I want to do acceleration parallel, how many uh, parallel engines I'm, I'm going to create. Right, so and the, inside the compiler, they will do automatic uh, on-chip uh, memory banking, partitioning, external memory uh, busting, streaming, and also the interface with OpenCL and so on and so forth. So uh, this has been very effective. Uh, for example, for this OpenCV library, um, used to be the case, uh, manual high-level synthesis design, you have to put in 20 some parameters. Uh, per design, right? About 50 some designs in the library. Uh, Merlin only need about one or two pragmas. And uh, not only that, that uh, so the, that's reduction on pragmas 15x. I use it in my class and I can see that the pragma reduction from 27 to nine. Moreover, that uh, the performance also improved by uh, 4.3x. So in fact, I just organized the workshop. There's a quite a big discussion about Merlin compiler. Again, it's open source now. That the thanks for Zilinx support. You can build things on top of that. So what we have is actually to build things that are on top of this. The goal is that the, even not one or two programmer, we want to have zero parameters. So the way we have is that, for example, you look at the one of this polybench example to do uh, basically double matrix vector multiplication. Code is like this. You can just give it to high-level synthesis to get a solution, but I bet the quality will not be very good. Uh, with Merlin, actually, it's quite clever that uh, you can just add three parameters. One is a pipeline, the other one is parallelization, and then the other one is parallelization with reduction. So that you get 122x speed up. So this is the optimized code. Um, if you have some uh, good hardware design intuition. So this pragmas are reasonable because it's not that too many. Now our goal is to remove this completely. And you can say, how do you do that? Of course, we want to give it to a machine learning algorithm. 
machine learning algorithm doesn't know where to put it in, where not to put it in. It will start with all the possible candidates, right? And then um, we will use a deep learning model to find out the best one. So you give me this uh, C, C++ protocol, we're going to learn compiler, and then we're going to get one solution, and then we're going to analyze the solution, just as you, for example, look at the VTune or other profiling result. You know where is the bottleneck, and then we're going to, for that loop, we're going to pipeline or unroll, and we're going to iterate. And also we may actually create some local perturbation. So we can get a number of designs. So that's actually how we generate the training database. We have to train a, a machine learning agent right, to do how to do that. And we do it not only for one application, we do it for a whole bunch of applications. And uh, so now the second time you give me a new design, right? I'm going to actually go through LVM compiler. This is a very popular compiler that the intermediate representation. From there, I get a graph because it's very difficult for machine learning algorithm just to understand your program text. Once you get a graph, we call that the CDFG control data flow diagram. So it tells that the how data is going to flow this graph, what kind of computation you do at every node, what's the dependency. This give a lot of information to a, a machine learning agent. And from here, actually now we're going to create a graph uh, neural networks. And the first we do the encoding part. Um, so this is the way you do graph encoding. Uh, so each node has a feature and you're going to compute a new feature iteratively uh, based on your neighbors. For example, this node one, neighbors two, four, and three, you do a weighted sum of their features and the weight is learned well. And then after that, you do a transformation of features from, uh, for example, from three vectors to uh, three elements vector to four elements vector. And this matrix can also be learned. It's quite similar to uh, the case with uh, deep learning for images. And eventually that uh, we add all of this together, we get a graph embedded that represents the program. From there, we have an MLP prediction layers for area delay and so on and so forth. So this is actually the model we have. Um, let me just show you some result. Um, so this is GS, uh, GNN stands for graph neural network, PSC stands for design space uh, exploration. You can see in terms of latency prediction, DSP, these are the resources, lookup table, flip flops, memory. So we are all very accurate compared to other methods. Okay? Um, then, also, you can see the benefit as you add more examples. Um, this is all normalized to the initial configuration. We get more and more accurate. Um, in fact, this result can be generalized. We could have transfer learning. So for example, we train this on 15 designs and with hundreds of or thousands of configuration. You give me a new design. Uh, actually, in this case, we tried four more new designs and uh, we actually can find these parameters. And uh, compared to other kind of a heuristic search, we can be somewhere 11x faster to all the way to 80x faster with comparable result. Used to be the case, you have to run 24 hours for one design, you can run less than one hour. So we are very encouraged by this uh, success. The key message is that uh, the program we start with has absolutely no problems. It's just a program very familiar very friendly to software programmers. Um, so with the time constraint, I think uh, I will now talk about the other effort, but we have uh, many other things going on. For example, we can take from TensorFlow to FPGA for deep learning acceleration. And uh, the previous talk also mentioned about the, these kind of accelerators. You may actually have application deal with uh, graph-based applications or other task parallel applications. So we have the package for Kappa, we can support legacy code. By the way, for a high level census to work, you cannot have pointers, you cannot have recursions, but now we can get transform the programs into this kind of a clean form more or less automatically. Now, you also need to do performance debugging. When you don't get the performance you want, you want to know, hey, where do I focus? So we have papers on this. And uh, we can integrate this in, into uh, near storage acceleration, and we can improve the clock frequency that uh, 
with a kind of automatic interconnect pipelining. And more recently, so that we can use this uh, uh, HRS-based methodology to reduce physical design time by massive parallelization to decouple the computation of each step. So all of this and uh, can take us another uh, a few hours to go through. So, but I will stop here. You're more than welcome to go to the website of my uh, the, uh, lab to get more details. So the, this is the final message I'd like to get. Uh, you may remember the Turing World Lecture by uh, Hennessy and Patterson back in 2008. They are saying we're in a new golden age for computer architecture. What I want to say is that uh, um, we want every programmer, not just the architects to participate in this golden age. And you can build your own customized accelerators, for example, on field programmable fabrics. And if you have more money, for sure, you can use the same methodology to build it on ASICs. And uh, this is either on-premise in our uh, own data centers and uh, or in a cloud. And uh, I hope many of you will join this effort. And uh, I hope our tools can help you to achieve this kind of goals. And with that, I want to thank the funding agencies, National Science Foundation, CRISP Center, and our CBSC industry partners. We have a very active uh, partnership program with uh, industries. So if you're interested, uh, we can we'll be glad to talk to you. Intel is a member, Samsung's a member, and uh, Qualcomm, and many others. So we hope more can join and work with us. And of course, all of these, uh, this result is only possible with a multi year dedicated effort from uh, students, postdocs, and many collaborators. Thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, it was an excellent uh, talk and great insights, uh, Jason. The numbers are amazing and amazing. That's all I can say. All the speed numbers that you mentioned, all the execution numbers that you mentioned are extremely good, Jason. Thank you so much for this. I have only one question, Jason. There is a question about, will these methodologies be extended for ultra, ultra low power applications? That's the question. So um, the ultra low power can come in that uh, in multiple ways, right? That uh, uh, one is at, at the device level, right at the circuit level. So now our emphasis with these tools obviously is at the architecture level. By this customization, and uh, if you don't have to go through this general purpose pipeline, we easily see uh, 10X, 100X in the energy efficiency improvement, power reductions. And so you don't get rid of all this extra logic which you don't need, right? So you just focus on. Um, also, there's an opportunity for algorithm architecture co-design. For example, the, we can take the arbitrary viewers to come down that, uh, to hardware acceleration. Take the um, machine learning as an example. You can um, reduce the bit width, right? It's a trivial, go from 16 bit to uh, 8 bits to 4 bits, sometimes in 2 bits. So that's one. Another trick we play is that uh, maybe you can have more bits, but uh, in each number you have, you only have. Uh, one non-zero bit. For example, I have eight bit numbers, right? So that can be um, uh, either, uh, depends where is this one and uh, you get a different one. So then this can be done very efficiently through shift instead of a multiplication, right? So if you can change your algorithm this way, then you can really uh, get a very efficient hardware implementation together with uh, um, that, uh, the algorithm innovation. So for that, for example, this particular work we had the paper, uh, with the best paper award in the uh, uh, Power Symposium, ISLTV, uh, I think it's 2019, you can look it up. Uh, that's an example, we put a big sparse uh, at the architecture. It's, uh, it's our honor to have you here, Jason. Thank you so much. My pleasure. But, uh, Thank you so much, Jason. Yeah.